24 candidates is on 22. So sh or shall we wait for a little while? No, probably probably even start. They they will join later. All right. So I begin by summarizing what we did yesterday very briefly, and. Um, slide for, uh, for the summary. So we um, worked out how we frame questions. We worked out how we search literature. Then we worked out how we extract data. And in data extraction, there were two or three important things. One was understanding what is the expected analysis, data analysis. So you can extract the numbers, but also to understand what is the quality of the study. And uh, when these data are extracted, we can move to the next stage called statistical or study or, or synthesis, data synthesis. It may or may not involve uh, meta-analysis, but we'll, we'll have a look. Uh, now, this will be my last session, so I just want to make sure that uh, in the two hours available to us, we cover everything that you wanted to cover. So in the next pause, which we will have in a few minutes, I'd be grateful if you could let me know um, where we are going to go with respect to your wishes. My plan is to present to you the following. So I would like to give you an understanding of what is meta-analysis today. And this uh, will be followed by what are the tips and tricks for writing systematic reviews for publication. So yesterday we had some doubt expressed whether performing a review is in fact uh, publishable with, within the context of your thesis. So hopefully after today you will be more confident that it is. And as part of the publication process we will look at tables and figures, and of course, you'll have opportunity to make comments and ask questions. Um, in addition, because many of you have uh, diagnostic projects as discussed yesterday, I'll give a short presentation about diagnostic studies and diagnostic meta-analysis. All right, so we move on. So here you see a table presented sideways in a published paper. A table should always be stand alone. The paper title information can frequently be repeated with some modifications in the title of the table. And any relevant methods and references may also have to be repeated inside the table. So it's very important, you just cannot write characteristics of studies. Well, you need to say characteristics of studies related to systematic review of, and then you can put some information from the title of your paper. So it's the same table presented now the right way around. And you can see that the source of evidence or reference is provided in the footnote. You can also see that um, the legend for quality is also repeated in the footnote, although it is also available in the published method section. So these are the key things. Uh, standalone 
ensure that it is clear what is in the table. So here you can see it doesn't just say evidence profile. It says evidence profile related to what? Okay, then people frequently ask about graphs. So for graphs, uh, here is a guideline or principles concerning graphs. Um, we saw the construction of the graph concerning forest plot uh, on the first day. Some of those same principles will be repeated here. The caption need to be fairly detailed, relevant to the complexity of the information presented. So these are some of the key points. Define all the data symbols. Caption and graph must the caption form a separate unit and must be fully self-explanatory without the need to refer to the text of the manuscript. And in this paper, they recommend not to use three-dimensional graphs. So here I present a graph concerning the quality of studies. Remember we talked yesterday about study quality and I showed you a table. The table has had these three features, randomization, double blinding, and withdrawal and dropouts. This type of information can easily be converted from a table into a graph like this. Here you can see that it provides information that numbers within the bar represent the number of studies. The axis of the bar gives percentage. It gives the short forms or abbreviations again, even though the manuscript itself uses RCT, but here the abbreviation needs to be described again. So I stop here for a moment and see if you have any questions about graphs and tables before we move on. Okay, no question. So I think we continue. I like to highlight to you the importance of what we are just discussing. Frequently, when you submit a paper, the editor will read your abstract. And if they like the paper, the next thing they might do is read the tables and figures. So please make sure that, uh, and, and the same applies to your thesis examiners. They might focus a lot on your tables and figures as well. So please make sure that your tables and figures are self-explanatory and detailed. Okay, so now we move to data synthesis. So we, I just remind you that I showed you earlier that there is a blob in the middle called estimate of effect. In this diagram that you see, this estimate of effect is relative risk. The measure of effect is relative risk. And the estimate is presented in this graph on this scale. And the confidence interval of the estimate is in this horizontal line. And you see that line here as well. In this meta-analysis, values less than one show that treatment is harmful, and values more than one show that the treatment is better. You will recall that yet, yet day before yesterday, I believe, we were discussing if the outcome is a positive outcome, then could the could the interpretation be switched? And that is exactly what's happening here. The outcome here is uh, pregnancy, which is a positive outcome, compared to death in cancer, which is a negative outcome. 
So here we have so many single, single studies put together in a meta-analysis, and when we put them together statistically, we get what is called a diamond. And this diamond is the same thing in that it has an effect estimate in the middle, and the length of the diamond presents the confidence interval, but it contains mathematically information contained in all of these studies together. I won't give you any more than this, other than to say that you should use an existing software to perform such an analysis for you instead of trying to figure out how to do it manually, and there are many software available. And for each software, they will have their own peculiarities, so you will need to get familiar with them. But in general, what is presented here is what will be uh, the framework for representing meta-analysis. The diamond is used for representing a summary of all the individual studies. The individual studies are presented with blob and line, and then all of these are combined together into a single result that's presented with a diamond. We'll have a quick look at other comments or questions. Which software do I prefer? Well, I don't prefer any software. I prefer well, whatever is suitable for uh, the work we do. Uh, Cochrane software is frequently used, but Stata is, I think, the friend of most meta-analysts. I think there are also bespoke softwares that can perform meta-analysis for you within the program uh, overall. And the, the software also allow you to generate the forest plot. Any further comment or question? Sarah, is the def explanation concerning diamond clear? Yes, uh, so it's, this is a review of a lot of different studies, and it shows us if we put all, everything together, what, is the, what would be the outcome. But the, the intervention is the same, I guess, right? Intervention is the same in all of these studies. Yes. Uh, the outcome is the same in all of the studies. The control is more or less the same in all of the studies. Okay, then then I understand what is the diamond used for. I didn't know that it was all about the same intervention. This is why I I was not sure why. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you for seeking that clarification. I should also point out, you use the word, the diamond shows the outcome of all the studies. No, uh, like if we put together, all the outcome, I mean, it's not, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm simply highlighting to you that using the correct term is really important. Okay. So you remember, what is the outcome from our PICO question? Mm, sorry, I didn't understand. The PICO question on the first day, participants, intervention, comparison, outcome. Yes. What was the outcome in that question? Oh, I don't remember now. But look, for example, in your question, I think the outcome was survival in somebody else. It was pregnancy. Ah, okay. Myocarditis uh, after the um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, yes. Right. Now, can you now see that if you use the outcome to say what you just said, it will not mean what we discussed on day one? Mm-hmm. The outcome simply refers to the things you measure on follow-up in a cohort study. It does not refer to the result of the study. Okay. 
So what you, I think what you meant, meant to say was, it, can, it is a summary result that contains all the results. Mm, yes. So you, now can you see the difference between the word result and outcome? Yes, probably. <laughs> well, well, look, it's important to think about this hard, because if you use the word outcome in your PhD viber, Maybe your examiner will not be happy. Okay. Yeah. So, one of the things I would like people to take home from this, these three days together, is that they use the words to mean exactly what they stand for. Outcome does not stand for the results. Outcome only stands for the outcome, nothing else. Make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. So we now move to the next stage. So in this slide, what we have seen is that there are individual studies, and if these studies have the same participants, interventions, comparisons, and outcomes, or more or less the same, I say more or less the same because it is possible that the control group may be placebo, or it may be nothing. I say this more or less the same because pregnancy may be measured by performing an ultrasound for 20 weeks or it may be live birth with the baby going home with parents. So this is why I use the term more or less. One of the problems in performing meta-analysis is that there are always differences between studies. And you have to make sense as to whether, in light of these differences, the creation of the diamond or the meta-analysis or the meta-analytic result or the summary result. So you can see the difference now between this is individual result or result of the individual trial. This is the name of the author. And then this diamond is the summary result. So we need to make a judgment whether making a summary result makes sense given the differences that may exist in the studies that have been captured by your search. Okay. Now this is the same diagram that you saw earlier. And its overall diamond is this. The same diamond that you saw here. Here. Can you see that? So now I'm going to give you an explanation about how to use information from the data extracted to make sense of a meta analysis like this. So the overall result is here. But we need to convince ourselves that the overall result is trustworthy. So in this particular case, there were only two high quality studies. We put them together and performed their meta analysis. And then the rest were low quality studies. We put them together and performed their meta analysis. And you can see that the low quality studies show, show a benefit and the high quality studies do not show any benefit. How does that sound? What's your interpretation? Would somebody like to volunteer, come forward and say what you think of this type of subgroup meta-analysis stratified according to study quality? Okay, now remember uh, Alexander asks, not everything was presented in the low quality studies. Remember I showed you yesterday 
a tool which measured the study quality on a scale from zero to five, and score of four and five were high quality, and score from zero to three were low quality. So it is this type of quality assessment as part of data extraction. Some people also call it risk of bias assessment. Some people also call it internal validity assessment. Uh, it's these type of assessments that can allow us to be able to understand what all the studies together mean. So Jaka just said the treatment does not seem to be beneficial based on this analysis. Jaka, would you like to explain why you say this? I mean, I'm not confident in, in my statement, but according to high quality studies, it, they show it's not beneficial. So, and even the local, and even all the studies to get together, they don't, I don't know. So that was the point I was making earlier, that when we have studies, they are possibly more or less the same, they are not exactly the same. In this case, we picked up the feature quality to see if the quality is different. Now, quality is not just, quality is not just a word, it is the essence of research. So a low quality study is basically a study that is not trustworthy compared to a high quality study. So it would be impossible for any meta-analyst using these data to recommend that the treatment is effective because the only studies that support this effectiveness are the studies that are not trustworthy with respect to quality. Low quality studies are still important. Question by Paulona. What do you mean by that? Paulona, you want to explain? Yes, uh, as I understood yesterday, you said that the low quality studies still have to be done. So we, we should not be afraid to do like this kind of studies. You mean have to be done by the primary researchers? Yes. Or have to be collected inside a meta-analysis? Oh yes, maybe that's the, that's the problem. So the, for the meta-analysis, you, you just have to choose as many good quality as possible. Okay, but remember, poor quality studies can be avoided if the researchers conduct their research well and report it well. So that's why I was in, I was curious that you used the word low quality studies are important and you also said they have to be done because to me low quality studies are not important and they don't have to be done so i just want to be clear that we that i haven't misunderstood the point you're trying to make Well, the low quality studies, I mean, on, on that grading system, there were some studies and case reports and stuff, and you said that these are also important studies and we should not avoid them, make such studies, although the highest quality of study is a systematic review study. Well, look, now we are mixing up many things. Let me just see if I can go back and explain this is important, uh, and we should not become confused about this. So, again, I request everybody to please use the words in their, in, in with the exact meaning you wish to refer to. So, I showed you the other day uh, this slide. 
and it shows you that different types of research can be primary research or systematic review research. So now I am confused what you mean when you say low quality study are still important and these still have to be done. And then you also refer to systematic review as a study. Let's see what we are talking about. Uh, I was uh, referring to the grading system. Okay. Also, I also remind you that until hearing the word grading just now, I have not used the word grading throughout the presentations. Or if I have used it, that step still need to be described in my presentation. So what are you referring to when you're talking about grading? Are you referring to quality assessment? Polona? Yes, yeah, sorry. You showed us a table uh, when it, it was like level of, I don't know, five levels. There were five levels. Yes, we go, we go to that table. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. We'll find that table in just a second. Here it is. Yes, here it is. So where do you see grade in here? No, no grade, just levels. Sorry, my mistake. Okay. Well, look, look, it's not a mistake. And this type of language imprecision is very common even among senior researchers. And it causes confusion and even leads to Errors. So, in science, I don't think we can be very casual. Well, when we are sitting down with family and friends and talking about something or the other, perhaps we can be casual. But when we are now discussing evidence synthesis and I think if you throw in the term grade the understanding of the word grade by other people may be quite different to the way you were using and again you say low quality studies are important I mean what do you mean by important that's also important to understand So the first thing important to understand is that primary studies are different from systematic reviews. So when we talk about studies and reviews, we should not use the word study to describe both. Because there's a recipe for confusion. Okay, second, when we say low quality studies are important, well, low quality studies are not trustworthy. In this case, in my mind, they are not important. Well, does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. Now, it is possible that low quality studies are included in a review. Just because a study is included in a review does not mean that study is important. In fact, the review probably in this case, as I showed you in this example, uh, has highlighted that in fact, low quality studies are not only not important, they are dangerous. Low quality studies here are extremely dangerous because they give us an impression that the treatment is effective when in fact it is not. So millions of 
mothers or sorry uh, women may have attended pregnancy clinic uh, infertility clinics and received these treatments based on low quality studies and in reality these treatments have no hope of giving them any help Okay, now we will very soon also learn about grading, Pona. Uh, so you, it's good you raised all these points, all these points now, because we are getting set to receive information about grading, which will be a bit later on. Information about quality of a study or quality of or of or level of evidence. Sorry, not level of evidence. Quality of studies or quality of evidence is only one of many different elements of grading. So that's why I was a bit surprised to use the word grade, because at the moment, the only thing we have talked about is quality of evidence or internal validity of evidence or risk of bias in evidence. And I hope I have shown you how information about quality of evidence can be extracted, collected, tabulated, and presented in a graph, and then how it can be used in a meta-analysis. Is that clear? If not, I'm very happy to repeat this quickly. Would you like for me to repeat this? Okay, you are clear. Any other colleague would like me to repeat? All right. Well, I didn't hear anything, so I'll proceed. Here I show you uh, a news item published on the web that University of Texas has found that vitamin C can help improve male fertility. Here is a published paper. Jaka, your question is, will we cover how to grade other type of studies too? We will briefly cover it, yes. Please, Jaka, I'm, I think you mean to say, will we cover how to assess the quality of other type of studies? Yes, thank you. Okay, so here is the published paper <coughs> based on which vitamin C is recommended for male fertility. And the outcome used to make this conclusion is sperm DNA fragmentation. Do you think this is a good outcome? What would be a good outcome, Sarah? What would be a good outcome? What about pregnancy? The couple is not really interested in DNA fragmentation or some other thing to do with a biochemical parameter. They came to the clinic in order to have a baby. So the real outcome of fertility treatment is having a baby, not changes in sperm DNA fragmentation. Does that make sense? Okay, and then a healthy child, Jaka, that's even better. Take home baby is frequently the term used to describe it, that a baby is born and goes home and is healthy, yes. 
Okay. Um, what is this? I think we saw this the other day. There was heterogeneity in data along with poor definition of outcome. Here is another uh, example of using information from data extracted in helping interpret the results better. So, Shows a possible association. This association is only supported by case control design and it is not supported by cohort design. Which design is better? Which design is higher quality? Cohort design is the higher quality, Jaka. Remember, I'll just take you back to, to the where a lower quality or a lower level of study design is driving the main meta-analytic summary results at the bottom of this flow diagram, of this forest plot. And I think in this type of a review, it should be possible to conclude that High quality evidence does not show any association, so there is no association. Make sense or would you disagree with my conclusion? Okay. Now we move to evidence grading. Okay, so evidence grading is, uh, but this thing is evidence grading that you see now. So you can see that there are many different elements inside the grading system in which study design is one element. Steady limitations or risk of bias is another element. Heterogeneity or inconsistency is another element. How the outcome is measured is another element. So the sperm fragmentation was indirect measure of outcome. The true direct measure was pregnancy. Imprecision, which is the length of the confidence interval, is another element. And there may be other considerations. And when all of this information is combined with the data, with the results reported, it is possible then to determine whether the overall quality of the information collected in a meta-analysis or systematic review. When we say overall quality, the other word for that is great. So you see this word is 
quality related to the studies. And this quality is the quality related to the grading when everything is considered. Just like on the first day we realize that people are confused between case control and cohort design because there's control in both designs. This type of grading system is also can be confusing. So Polona, I just want to remind you that you should not feel bad about what you said earlier, describing quality as grading, because the terminology in the literature is itself confusing. Now, given that this confusion exists in the literature, it is really important that we are very clear in our own language so that we don't expand or exacerbate the confusion. So, I also showed you in my slide earlier that randomized trials were considered level A evidence. But now you can see that when grading is applied, the quality of the findings is down to low. Can you see that? So don't just be fooled if there is a randomized trial and just blindly believe it. A systematic reviewer's job is to assess the quality, assess the inconsistency, assess the precision or confidence interval, and considering all this information, these pieces of information putting them together, then you can compute an overall grade or overall quality. One way to, uh, to describe this graphically is to present these things in the tables in the form of a graph where each line of the graph represents each item and and uh, I'll be able to show you an example uh, just a, a, a bit later on. And within this graphic framework, we can plot whether all of this area is covered or not. Okay, but I'm going to I'm going to just stop here for a moment and see what your comments are because now we have covered all the different steps of a systematic review. We have learned about framing the question. We have learned about how from the question search strategy can be created. We have learned about how data can be extracted concerning quality. We've learned about how meta-analysis can be performed and that it can take into account quality in order to give better interpretation. And finally, we have looked at what is grading of evidence. So I'd like to stop here. By now, we have covered systematic review. We have also covered randomized trial. I'd like to take all your questions and comments concerning these two things at this stage. And then uh, once we've covered your questions, we will then move on to systematic reviews of diagnostic research. <laughs>